to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here alone again. Don't worry, I think uh, this will all clear itself out sooner or later. Um, eventually, we'll be back to normal, and I'll have Liberty Larry here. Um, I've been experimenting with uh, Skype and some other options over the weekend. Unfortunately, um, I can't experiment with Liberty Larry because he does not have internet at his house somehow still in 2020. Um, so there'll be no Skyping with, uh, with Liberty Larry, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll make something work out. Eventually we'll all be enough over this that we'll start meeting up in real life again. And, uh, I, I can't, wait until then. Um, but I have been talking to him and, uh, so, you know, we're, we're gonna try and get, continue to get content out to you in the meantime. Schedule will be a little weird and, um, the shows will probably be a little shorter because there's no dialogue, just me. So, uh, but as I said, eventually we'll get back to normal. Um, I've been putting this off a little lazy. I meant to uh, get another podcast out to you days ago, at least, maybe more. Um, but I I was having a hard time uh, thinking about really what to talk about because since the news is completely focused on the coronavirus and um, I'm a little bit paranoid and, and uh, definitely a hypochondriac, I've had to shut myself off from the news entirely. Um, I have not been um, reading or watching really any news for more than a week now. Uh, it's better for my own mental health and probably my physical health too because the one affects the other. So, um, you know, this will this will be, be short, but... Um, well, hopefully it'll be it'll continue to offer you some things to think about. So, even though I'm still more or less uh, quarantining myself and trying to avoid contact, and and I urge others to do the same, I still maintain that the uh, what they're saying about this is a bit overblown. Um, and uh, so I was talking to to Liberty Larry over the weekend, and apparently a a friend of ours. Um, Liberty Larry was making our point um, that you know this is a bit overblown and and uh, it, it's irritating to have the the media um, continue to promote a, an idea to sensationalize um, and exaggerate maybe the the uh, extent to of the danger here and uh, I you know for me it's just it's the media who cried wolf. Um, I think that they're, you know, they're really concerned about making sure that we all stay home and and not interact with each other and not spread the virus. And I understand that. Um, and what I would say is between the media and the government, it would probably be easier for them to convince us that it was in our own best interest to make these decisions for ourselves um, rather than having to enforce you know, quarantines and business closures and so forth, if they hadn't spent the last several decades lying to us about everything. Um, I've been told so many times that this is going to be the next thing that's going to kill me, and yet I'm still here. So at some point you start to think, uh, well, you know, I, I can't trust anything that they say. And uh, I suppose Liberty Larry was making this point to a, a friend of ours, and he... Um, he suggested that it started with Hurricane Andrew, which was in the early 90s, um, and that it was uh, underplayed by the media to some extent, and then people died. Um, so I, I couldn't remember this specifically. I was in high school, I guess. and uh, But I, I went back and I, I read up on it, and really, I guess what it came down to was that the um, this hurricane, as it was crossing the Atlantic, was moving and, and not really strengthening. It, the, it wasn't intensifying. And then suddenly, essentially in the last day uh, before it hit the coast of Florida, or actually I guess before it hit the, the Bahamas, um, and then into Florida, 
in a 24 hour period, it, it intensified tremendously and ended up being one of the strongest storms to ever hit the, the U S and, uh, and I get it. So then the media says, "Oh well, we didn't uh, we didn't tell people, we didn't play it up as much as we should have," and and then people died because of that. And well, maybe that's true, maybe not. I, I would say that people make their own decisions either way. Um, even if they had been, even if they'd been telling us the whole time that um, the storm was going to kill people and it was going to be one of the strongest storms that ever hit the coast, there are going to be some people that think that they would rather die in their own homes. And I get that, and that's up to them. For me, it's the job of the media, and really the government for for that matter, um, is to provide information for the people to make their own decisions, not to save people. That's not their job. Um, their job is to provide information and so that people can make the best decision that they think for themselves. So now here we are, um, a few weeks into this, and... Uh, and they've essentially this now switching from media to the government. Um, they've essentially imprisoned the whole country. Um, all these lockdowns all over the place, these forced business closures. Um, the you know, well, welcome to the plantation, everyone. Um, you're you're imprisoned in your own home, and the response is, you know, what what would you do if I go out in these places that are having like trying to enforce strict lockdowns. What if I go out? Are you going to imprison me in my home, and if I leave my home, imprison me in prison? Um, people should still be able to make their own decisions. In fact, it's codified, First Amendment, um, the right to peaceably assemble. And I understand that it brings up some points about at what point does the exercise of your freedom threaten everybody else. And I think that we'll have that discussion when this is all said and done. I certainly want to have Liberty Larry here when we have that discussion. That one needs to be a dialogue. Um, but I'm still on the on the voluntarist side, and you know we've we've really tanked our economy through these forced business closures, and the the market can find a way to continue to do business. It, like you forced a recession in a lot of ways. Oh, and just something to think about. There's two sides to this, obviously, but um, I, I find it interesting. Well, okay, so they say um, that only essential businesses will remain open. Well, every business is essential to somebody, or they wouldn't be in business. Um, so, I, I, you know, I mentioned this to a, another friend, and He's saying, well, that's why they provided guidelines. But if you look through the guidelines of what is considered to be essential business, you notice that it's it's the businesses that the federal government is most involved with through subsidies, regulations, um, enforcement of legislation in various ways. And you could take the point that the federal government is really involved in these because they're essential businesses. But I think it's just as valid to make the other point to say that the federal government has identified these as essential businesses because they're so involved with them. And the, the people in those businesses are so involved in, you know, financing campaigns. You don't want to put the people out of work that are giving you the money for your next campaign. Um, but back to the market itself, uh, there's plenty of ways that people could figure out to get around this. Um, I, I saw an interesting story where uh, some um, topless bar, I don't remember where, Florida maybe. Anyway, they'd uh, obviously been closed as a non-essential business, and so they just changed their business model to become an essential business. Um, and they, uh, they changed their name and um, started providing food delivery. So now it's topless food delivery. I think that's genius, first off. Um, you know, it, it does show that people will get around the, the regulations um, regardless of what you do. But this is the kind of, uh, of innovation, I think, that the market would, um, would uh, let's see, would, um, you know, this is the kind of innovation that would allow the market to continue. Um, 
without government intervention in this kind of thing. So there's a lot of businesses that, are, you know, they'll have to cut back staff. And, oh, man, have they cut back staff with the closures? Uh, just as a, another side point before I really get into what the market can do to, to sustain business even through times like this, um, the unemployment rate in the last week, two weeks, um, something like that has jumped from, uh, the official numbers from three and a half percent to five and a half percent that, uh, 3.3 million people filed for unemployment in a week. Um, that's a tremendous number of Americans, like 3.3 million. There's 330 million Americans. Um, not all of them are working, but literally an entire percentage of the total population of the country filed for unemployment in a week. This is this is devastating on people. Like um, Trump talked about, uh, is the the um, cure worse than the disease? I think this. I, I would say yes. Um, the unforeseen consequences of this many people being out of work, um, you know, we'll we'll feel it for a long time. Although they'll never connect it back to this, um, but it's going to cause its own health problems um, and other economic problems, uh, both mental and physical health. Just yeah. Um, Financial stress is uh, one of the most impactful, um, rarely talked about uh, causes of um, both physical and mental uh, medical issues. And stresses on marriages and everything else. So the, the impact of, of the nationwide economic shutdown, <laughs> essentially... Um, is going to be tremendous, and I, I suspect actually will be far worse than um, spreading this uh, this virus around that has a, a fairly low mortality rate. Um, but anyway, uh, back to the market. So there's a lot of ways that businesses can innovate to keep their business going. Um, I, I think that there's, uh, well, first off, it's triggered a lot of things in terms of various businesses that are permitted to keep going, um, changing their practices to try and keep people safer. Um, you see a, a lot of things where um, um, grocery stores are uh, opening early in the morning and having time periods where only people that are most at risk, um, elderly, uh, people with pre-existing conditions or, or um, exacerbating com conditions can come and shop. Uh, they are cleaning extensively overnight, so this is the cleanest store will ever be. They only letting those people in. They're limiting the number of people that they allow in to a store at any one time. Um, they're uh, wiping down everything. Um, you know, I'm kind of I, I'm I'm opposed to the war on cash, but I do understand the uh, the promotion of using cards and so forth. Um, so there's very little actual like physical interaction between a cashier and the uh, and the customers. These are lots of things that, that people can do. Um, you know, restaurants are uh, converting their staff from being servers to drivers. Uh, there's a, a lot of things that um, companies can do. But here's the main thing. The, the market works itself out. Uh, if you let people make their own decisions and make decisions based on what they think is best for themselves. And so there's going to be uh, a set of people that are not going to go out. The, they're not going to buy stuff. They're going to um, order things online, leave it on the porch for, uh, you know, 24 hours to make sure that anything on it has died before they bring it in. Who knows? Um, but there and there are going to be employees that feel the same way, that want to self-quarantine, uh, that can't work from home and just choose not to work to protect themselves during this period. So um, you, you bring them out of the mix in terms of competition. Then there's going to be people that feel like the risk is worth it to go out and continue to live their lives. And in order to serve those people, there's going to be employees that also feel the same way, um, that the that it is more valuable to them um, to go out and earn some money than it is to sit at home and, and protect their health potentially. Besides the fact that the government can't protect you by the but by the way, from this virus, no matter what they tell you. Um, but, you know, then, uh, of course, if businesses need more people to do whatever services that they're providing, whether it be um, delivering their products or um, 
or actually uh, serving people that, that enter the stores, then if they can't get enough employees to do it, if they have too many that decide that it's better for them to stay home, then they can start offering more money. Uh, hazard pay, essentially, right? Um, and so, there, I mean, these are just like a couple of things that uh, businesses can do. Um, and I, I think that most businesses would do better if they were given the option about how they want to handle this crisis on their own than being forced to close. Because there's a lot of businesses that won't survive this. And speaking of that, you know, there are, some, there are going to be some businesses that will survive this because they have uh, saved and put capital aside um, during all this time. And, uh, you know, good for them. There's a lot of businesses that are deeply in debt. And that's also partly the government's fault. Like, if you maintain um, interest rates at near zero for, you know, more than a decade, uh, then it encourages people to spend money that they don't have. Um, whereas if you allowed a market rate in interest, uh, then um, interest rates would probably be higher and there would be more people that had saved. And, and an economy is built on capital savings, so uh, you've actually made it more difficult for a recovery as well. Because once this is all done, when a bunch of businesses have failed and there's new um, niches avail available in the market for new businesses, people haven't saved up capital, or very few people have, because they haven't been incentivized to in any way. This is where it's good to have uh, Gary here, so that he can kind of keep me on track. Um, but I, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna shift gears here. I mean, I think it's a you know I've made it clear enough that there's it, if you allow the market to operate on its own, uh, there will be plenty of innovations, many more than I can come up with here, uh, that businesses will utilize to um, keep their business going. And um, Forcing shutdowns and then providing loans is not the best answer. Um, there's going to be a lot of uh, particularly smaller businesses that won't make it through this. And uh, as I said last week or two weeks ago, whenever I last recorded, um, I think that the uh, really the lifeblood of the economy, um, besides capital savings that they've ruined through low interest rates, is uh, small businesses, um, new businesses, um, competition and innovation. So, uh, moving to another topic in this, even though all of the news is about coronavirus itself, uh, the wars go on. And <clears throat> so there was some encouraging news a week or two ago um, with uh, President Trump offering aid to North Korea although it was kind of submarined by some comments that Pompeo made just days later that they took offense to. But um, this is how we should be handling everything. Um, I should have, actually I might at this point, pull a clip. There's a great rant from Scott Horton um, in at the end of one of his interviews in the last week or two, where he goes on, this is our opportunity um, to all our, our rivals, quote unquote, um, to kill them with kindness. Say, you know, to be that shining beacon on the hill that we used to be able to claim that we were um, by offering everything that we can to help these countries cope. Uh, you know, all kinds of humanitarian, medical aid, food aid, um, supplies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, you know, the, I, I, I agree. Um, this is our opportunity. But while we had this encouraging news of offering aid to North Korea and trying to um, take this opportunity to improve relations with North Korea, which, you know, for whom, I guess we should say, um, we have very little information about how significant the virus has been there. Um, but on the other hand, um, we're adding new sanctions on Iran uh, this was a couple of weeks ago, mid-March, uh, we added new sanctions on Iran uh, amid one of the most severe coronavirus outbreaks uh, in the world. Um, China, Italy, Spain, Iran, apparently the U.S. now, um, these are countries that have been really badly hit. But in the U.S., while there's a lot of cases, there hasn't, you know, the mortality rate hasn't been terrible. But in Iran, the mortality rate has been terrible. 
And instead of taking this opportunity to say, um, you know, the people are really suffering there, we're like turning the screws instead. Um, so while the government's offering you your $1,200, which is peanuts in the grand scheme of things, um, that's like uh, half a month of work for a lot of people or less. Um and I suppose it's a month of work for a lot of people too, but still, I mean, is that going to make up for what you're losing here by having your job forcibly shut down? See, need Gary to keep me on track. <clears throat> but the uh, Iranian economy was already struggling um, before the virus outbreak because of our sanctions, at least partially. Um, I would say mostly uh, because of our sanctions. So the Iranian economy was already struggling. Their government can't help the people out during this time. Um, they can't provide $1,200 or a month's worth of, of uh, pay um, to get them through this problem. Um, so we're – and instead of just leaving it be even, uh, even if you just maintain the status quo, that would be better than adding new sanctions um, in the last couple of weeks. And these financial uh, – so – they say that the sanctions um, that the U.S. has applied to Iran uh, don't affect humanitarian stuff like medicine and so forth, uh, but it's a lie. Um, the, I mean, they don't directly, but um, the sanctions on things like financial institutions particularly uh, make all imports, um, including uh, medical imports, uh, difficult and risky for the financial institutions um, because if uh, the U.S. Uh, you know, decides to sanction the financial institution in response for facilitating trade uh, with Iran, um, then they have a lot to lose as well. And beyond just the uh, the the simple like transferring money from one group to another uh, to pay for things that's made so difficult by the um, financial institution sanctions that the U.S. has applied and the threats to every other country in the world about trading with Iran. Um, just uh, think about how nuclear materials are used in medicine. And, of course, you know, you can't even – you absolutely couldn't uh, risk, um, you know, trading or facilitating a trade of any kind of nuclear medicine to Iran right now. This is what it's all about, right, is uh, making sure that Iran doesn't go nuclear, which they were never really trying to do and have no intention of uh, doing. But anyway – um, you know, nuclear uh, materials are used uh, in medicine to treat cancers and thyroid is issues, uh, a whole lot of diagnostic procedures, particularly imaging, um, like the, uh, the PET scans, um, the radioactive dye injections that are used for some CT scans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Like the um, Iranian people have been deprived of all of these things uh, and more. Um, and they're really suffering terribly. And instead of the U.S. saying, hey, look, uh, you know, we've, we've had our problems in the past, but we see that you're having a really rough time here, and we're going to make sure that you get the medical supplies that you need and the help that you need to get your people through this terrible virus. And then we'll talk about the nuclear stuff again later. Instead of doing that, we're saying, no, no, we're locking the border down even more. We're making sure that even less gets into your country. Uh, I can't believe how how inhumane this approach is and it i hope that it doesn't represent the people of the united states of america that that's how we would react in such a situation um i, I was reading uh I, I finished up sheldon richmond's book about um uh, the israeli-palestinian conflict last night and there was a line in there i should have written it down um but he said something along the lines of um that um, it's not togetherness that has to be enforced by the government. Um, it's uh, separateness and, and hate and distrust. That's what has to be enforced by the government. Um, if people are free to interact on their own terms, to make their own choices, that in the long run, uh, cooperation wins out. And I, I think we're seeing that right here, is that I think that I, I hope that the American people would see the suffering in Iran and say, we want to do what we can to help. And in the meantime, our government is saying, we're going to make sure that this is as terrible for you as we can possibly make it. 
So, um, and they seem to be kind of doing the same thing here by uh, forcing business shutdowns and saying it's for your own health, whereas the the economic fallout um, is not going to be uh, good on the health of the country in general. And I suppose that's what I've got for today. Um, I hope that that came out all right. And uh, it looks like my recorder's still recording, so I didn't run out of batteries. And uh, I guess we'll we'll close it up there. Um, we'll be back again, or at least I'll be back in, I don't know how long, whenever. Um, in the meantime, as always, uh, follow us on um, Facebook, subscribe on iTunes or Podbean, uh, like and share, um, tell your friends, um, yeah, and all those other things that I always ask you to do. We'll be back uh, when we're back, when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try and stay free. Ciao.